Good morning, church. My name's Josh. I'm the lead pastor here at Hill City Church. It's so good to be with you today to be back. I was away for a few weeks, but now I'm back. And uh, just in time for the final week of our Signs Teaching Series. If you're just joining us, we've been in the midst of a seven-week series. Have you enjoyed this teaching series? It's been really powerful. And we've been looking at these seven miracles from the Gospel of John. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open to John chapter 11. Because guess what? We're going through the whole chapter today, and it's a long chapter. And uh, so go ahead and get your Bibles uh, open to John chapter 11. But John specifically highlights these seven miracles. Jesus performed, we know, many more than seven miracles, right? In fact, at the end of John's gospel, he said, listen, if I tried to write down all the miracles, I couldn't, like all the libraries of the world couldn't, contain everything that Jesus has done because Jesus has just, you know, did, did all these really powerful things. But John highlights seven, and he doesn't name the miracles. He calls them seven. It's on the screen, people, okay? I know I've been away for a few, It's seven s- signs because these signs are pointing to something. They're pointing to who Jesus is and what God's kingdom is all about. About. But as we've been talking about miracles, I just want to pose a question to you. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you've said, I need a miracle? Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where you got bad news, found yourself in a bad situation, maybe a bad diagnosis, and you recognized in that moment that there was nothing humanly possible that could fix the situation? True? And you said, we need a miracle. I need a miracle. You're at the end of your rope. We believe in prayer as a church. Faithful prayer is one of our core values. We say that prayer for us is a first response, not a last resort. But if we're honest, there are times where it is kind of also a last resort. Where it's like you're just, you're at the end of your rope. You're totally powerless. You're hopeless on your own. And you need a miracle. That's a place called Desperation. Can you say that word? Desperation. Desperation. Maybe you've been at a point of desperation. Well, what desperation can do is it can actually lead you one of two directions. Desperation can lead you, if you stay in that place, to despair, to a place where you stop praying, where you give, give up hope, and you feel like there's nothing that can be done or will be done, and you stop believing. Or it can lead you to another place called dependence. You can find, and this is what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at one of the most famous miracles of Jesus, also one of the most difficult passages. We're going to talk about one of the great questions of human existence, the problem of pain. Why do bad things happen? Why do we suffer? Why does God allow these things in our world and in our lives? But what we're going to find today is that place of desperation, I need a miracle, is a, it's a terrible, beautiful place to be. Do you see the paradox? It's like a terrifying, beautiful place to be. Because if you allow God to work in your heart, he can move you to a place of deeper dependence on him than you ever thought was possible. And that is a beautiful way that God works in the midst of pain and suffering. And I I enter into this passage today just recognizing that for many people in the room, this is not theoretical or hypothetical. This is not, oh, how would I respond if I, you know, should something bad happen to me? For some of you, you're going through deep grief today. You're in the pit today. You're in the valley of the shadow of death today. And I hope and I pray that God can encourage you. We're looking at the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus is a shortened uh, form of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means the one whom God helps. Aren't we all kind of like a Lazarus in a way? Dependent on God for his help? And I hope that you would believe today that God is good even in the midst of pain and suffering. Jesus and his disciples in John chapter 11 are in an undisclosed location. 
And sometimes it's, you know, we just don't know where they were at when this event took place. But I think intentionally in John chapter 11, they're in an undisclosed location because the heat is on Jesus and his ministry. His religious opponents, the Pharisees, have not just once, but numerous times already sought to kill him. And so Jesus and his disciples are, we would call it, off the grid, okay? They're letting things cool down a little bit. And really, they only have one job. Don't go to Judea. Certainly don't go to Jerusalem. And don't do anything too spectacular. (laughs) That might draw too much attention. And it's in this moment that the problem arises. You with me there? John chapter 11, starting in verse 3. This is Mary and Martha. So the sisters sent to him, they sent a message to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. This is a reminder to us to keep this in mind throughout our entire passage today that God can use your pain and suffering to bring himself glory. He can bring beauty from ashes. He can bring life from death. And he can use it. And uh, Jesus says something really interesting. He says, this illness will not lead to death. Of course we know, it actually does. Jesus gets this message, and we have to remember that Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, that he's called the one that you love. This is like one of Jesus' best friends. Right? That's a little bit different, right? When some random person from the crowd comes up and touches Jesus, you know, his cloak, or they, they, they ask Jesus, come visit my child, they're sick. It's just like anybody, right? And what I love about Jesus is he allows anybody to interrupt him, doesn't he? He cares about you. Even if today's your first day in church in your entire life, he cares about you. He knows you. And yet, it hits a little bit different when it's someone that you really know, doesn't it? Like you get a prayer, like, and that's something about like the proximity to pain as a pastor, it like comes with the job. We, we read the prayer requests, we pray through the prayer requests, and so we just are familiar with like, you know, this is a season where there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of people hurting. It's different when it's an anonymous prayer request, right? To where it's like your mom calls you, isn't it? And this is like one of those situations that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are very close friends of Jesus. But one of the problems is they live in Bethany, which is only a handful of miles from Jerusalem. The very place that Jesus and his disciples, I believe, are intentionally trying to avoid. And so Jesus just says, this is a situation that I am certain that God will be glorified through this. And he waits a few days, and his disciples aren't sure why he isn't more urgent about that. Had you ever feel like that? Like you feel the urgency? God, I want you to do this, and I don't want you to do this anytime. I want you to do it now. That's how we pray, isn't it? It's okay to be a little bit bold in your prayers. But that's how we pray. I don't want this done yesterday. I want it done now. You know, like, and so you pray and you ask God with, with boldness, and yet Jesus is just almost like casual here. We'll just just hang out here a couple more days. And he stays a few more days until he's certain that Lazarus has passed away from his illness. And his disciples aren't really sure what's going on because he says Lazarus has fallen asleep. They're like, good, you know, if you're sick, you should nap or whatever. And they're not really sure, like, why is he talking like this? And Jesus is like, finally, at at the end of this section, he has to explain it very clearly. This is John 11, verse 14. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. He knows this. Prophetically, he knows this. There's no, there's no social media. There's no announcement. He, he knows that Lazarus has died. And this is kind of crazy. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And so Thomas, the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we might die with them. Now, this is really interesting. You can see the gravity of like, we can't even set foot in Bethany or our lives are at stake. Can you see that? 
there's danger around that geographical area. And so Thomas, you know, speaking with boldness, is like, we're going to go and we're going to, you know, we're going to be martyrs. We're going to die for our faith. Well, when Jesus would actually be arrested and crucified, there was only actually one of the 12 standing at the foot of the cross still. So there's a, there's a big difference between, it was, it was John who wrote the Gospel of John and, and the women around the cross witnessing the actual crucifixion of Christ. And so there's a big difference between saying, I'm willing to die for you, or I'm willing to, it's like, would you live for him? Would you follow him even to those difficult places? And, uh, and, and so Jesus says, listen, I'm going to do something so that you might believe. You see that? That even in the moments of our deepest, darkest pain, our faith can grow. And I'm actually not sure our faith can really grow to the fullest maturity unless we go with Jesus through the valley. There is certain work that God can only do in us in those dark places. And so I just want to challenge you and encourage you, if you're in one of those places, would you let God do his work? And so Jesus decides to attend a funeral for one of his best friends. And at this funeral, he brings four gifts, if you're taking notes, okay? Four gifts that Jesus brings with him to the funeral. They make the journey, uh, they make, uh, the journey to Bethany. And the journey takes a number of days, and by the time they arrive, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. And Martha, we presume is the older sister. She's the one at least who fits the characteristics of an older sister. She's always taking care of everybody. She's always preparing things. Very likely, the funeral arrangements, if you've ever gone through a situation like that, somebody has to make the phone calls. Somebody has to get the catering orders. You, you know what I'm saying? very likely Martha steps up. We don't know that. I'm just, just from what I know of her character, she seems like she would be the one. So they arrive, Jesus and disciples arrive in Bethany, and Martha is the first one to see Jesus coming. And look at what she says to him in verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Do you see the pain in her voice? If you had only been here, you know, a lot of us ask the why God question. We ask the why, like, why does this happen? Why does that happen? And we're looking for the reason behind the pain and the suffering. Martha asks the where question. Where were you? Where have you been? What's taken you so long? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's pain. There's maybe even a little bit of blame in her question, and yet do you see the deep faith that she also expresses? Even now, her brother's been dead for four days. Even now, she knows that Jesus has the power to raise someone back to life. Even now, God will give whatever you ask. And this is how Jesus responds to, I believe, one of this, this is just a, I would see a profound declaration of faith. He hasn't done the miracle yet. She already believes he can. Man, that's, isn't that a model for prayer? To go before God, to speak honestly with God, to ask God those questions that almost seem like unbiblical to ask him. To just be like brutally honest, but then also to declare in this very same breath, God, whatever, whatever you want is possible. To declare God's goodness and his power Jesus answers in verse 23, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So now we're in a theological conversation, which to be honest, everyone deals with grief differently. And some people switch right on to trying to figure things out. Trying to, like what happens is something terrible takes place in your life and it kind of shatters your framework. It shatters your perception of the world and how things work. And you're left kind of trying to make sense of it all and trying to pick up the pieces. I believe Martha in this moment has these theological things she's wrestling with. And honestly, she's pretty theologically sharp. 
She recognizes there will be a resurrection on the last day. She knows biblical end times theology, which is like more than I could say for a lot of people, honestly. And so she says, well, he says, your brother will rise again. And she, she's thinking, well, far off, like, well, it, all of us will rise again. And I know there's going to be a judgment day. And she recognizes all of that. And yet this is how Jesus responds in verse 25. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever, somebody say whoever. Whoever Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone, somebody say everyone. everyone. Is this available to you? This is available to you today. You hear that? Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And so this theological conversation, trying to make sense of it all, Martha has these these questions, these doubts, and that's what happens to us, doesn't it? When when tragedy strikes, we're left trying to pick up the pieces and make sense of it all and trying to understand the world and God and ourselves. Jesus just took this theological conversation to the next level. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus, in this moment, claims to have power over the grave. And he says, whoever and everyone, those who put their faith in him, not just believe him, but believe in him. Does that make sense, the difference between that? Not just like, yeah, I believe you, Jesus. I understand what you're saying and I accept those things as true. That, it's important, is it important to believe Jesus? Yes, you should believe Jesus. But the faith that he's talking about is a, is a trust in him. A better way to say it would be a surrender to him as your Lord and your savior. We just sang, we, we just sang the song, like, we crown you. That's what it means for him to be the king king in your life, the one that you trust, the one that you put your hope in, and this is the very first of the four gifts, okay, that Jesus brings to this funeral. He brings truth for Martha. Truth with a capital T. The kind of truth that Jesus is referring to when he says the truth will set you free. He's not just saying, you know, being smart and understanding things and learning and academics. He's not saying that stuff will set you free. He's saying capital T, truth. Knowing Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, the truth of who he is, the truth of who God is, will lead to freedom. And he answers her question with a question of his own. He says, do you believe? Because the truth of Christ only helps if you believe him. Do you believe? I want to tell you, if you would put your faith in Jesus Christ today, you can have hope that even the grave could not stand against it. As Paul would write later, we grieve whenever there's death, we grieve whenever there's tragedy, but we do not grieve as those without hope. Because we have hope, don't we? This is the the greatest human hope, hope, this is what we cling to, that in Christ Jesus, those who die will rise again, will be saved, will live forever with God, with his people, in a renewed heavens and earth. And I just wanna pose that question to you. Do you believe that today? Do you have that living hope today? It's available to you by the work that Jesus accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the first gift that Jesus gives us. He gives us truth. Now Jesus goes from that place deeper into the village. Martha met him kind of on the outskirts and he continues into the village and Mary goes to fetch, uh, or Martha goes to fetch Mary who's still at home. Look at what Mary says to Jesus in verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Sound familiar? Word for word. How many times have these two sisters over the last four days said this line to one another? Do you, you see this? Same pain. And yet, no expression of 
And you know, they're not getting into a theological conversation. They're not dealing with, with any of that. The difference between Mary and Martha, and we see this like personalities, right? Every personality goes through grief and trauma and, and pain and suffering differently. Martha's trying to make sense of it all. What happens is Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she falls down, collapses at his feet, weeping. It's not a single tear, like at the end of a, you know, a, a good movie, you know, it's not like, ah, oh, this is ugly crying. This is snot. This is trembling. This is maybe even wa- like wailing, screaming. Do you see that? Mary has a little, she's going through grief a little bit differently than Martha, and that's okay. And here's how Jesus responds. In verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the English Bible, John eleven thirty-five. Great memory verse. <laughs> if you want a place to start and you struggle to memorize Jesus wept. What's he doing here? He already, does Jesus know what he's about to do? Spoiler, I already told, it's about the resurrection of Lazarus, okay? We know what he's about to do. Like from the beginning of the chapter, we know what he's gonna do before he's done it. The sisters don't, but we know. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, and yet he still weeps. This is profound. What he's doing is he's bringing his second gift to the funeral, tears. Jesus has tears for Mary. To someone who's not asking questions, they're not trying to make sense of the world, they don't, in fact, opening up the Bible and reading eschatology, it's probably not the best move for many people in the midst of trauma. Sometimes the best thing that you can do is to weep with those who weep. This is what Paul says in Romans 12, 15. To rejoice with those who rejoice and to simply weep with those who weep. And I believe that these are tears motivated by compassion. They're not conjured up. They're not false tears. They're motivated by Jesus seeing and experiencing some of the pain that's in Mary's heart. And what he allows himself to do is he allows himself to enter into the pain with her. But in order for Mary to experience this profound moment, she has to come to Jesus, doesn't she? She's in the house. And I want, and if you stay in the house, in that pain, in that trauma, in that suffering, and you're, Martha comes up, he's here, Jesus is finally here, right? You see that? Where have you been? You're in that pain, you're in that suffering. Imagine if Mary said no. I don't even want to see him right now. Have you been in that place? I just want to say this to you. If you want to experience this gift of compassion from God, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Bring him your ugly cries. Bring him your trembling. Bring him your shouting. Bring him whatever you've got. Because you can't really experience that compassion, that love, that God weeping with those who weep while you're shutting the door and keeping him out of your life. True? Would you come to Jesus? This is a beautiful invitation because Jesus has tears for Mary, but guess who else he has tears for? He has tears for you. He has compassion for you. And if you allow God to do this, God will enter into your pain with you. The Holy Spirit, another title for the Holy Spirit is our comforter, our counselor, our advocate. But if God's knocking on on the door of your life, would you just come to him and allow him to enter into those moments with you and bring him whatever you've got. 
It's the second gift, tears for Mary. And Jesus asks, well, where is he? Where is, where's the tomb? Where's Lazarus been laid? And they come to the tomb, and this is a tomb likely very similar to the one that Jesus would be laid in not very long from this moment. And this is what Christ does when he arrives at the tomb in verse 43. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. And his hands and feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. There's a stone rolled in front of the tomb and the people are hesitant to open it because that just seems a little bit unholy, doesn't it? It's dig, almost like to dig up a grave. And they're not just worried about kind of like desecrating the burial site. They're also, it's been four days. They're, wor- they're worried about this, like the practice, like it's going to smell in there. What's going to, you know, it's like, this is, you know, there's, this is uncharted territory. And Jesus says, roll the stone away anywhere. And he, with a simple command, Lazarus, come out. This dead man comes back to life. And Jesus demonstrates through this sign, through this miracle, what he's just spoken to Martha about. I am the resurrection and life. He proves it within the same hour that he says it. Do you see that? That's what this sign is pointing to. It's pointing to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So Martha had a problem, you know, kind of a a problem in her mind. She's trying to think about things and wrestle with things. Mary had a problem with her her heart. She's feeling things really deeply and she's broken hearted. Lazarus also has a problem. He's dead. His body, like his body. Right? For some of us, we're the, one, we're the ones on the outside looking at someone going through pain and suffering. Lazarus is the one who personally experienced death. And so this is where Jesus brings his third gift to this funeral. He gives life to Lazarus by simply saying the words, Lazarus, come out. Jesus will give life to all those who believe in him, to all those who put their faith and their trust in him. He has that same power. In fact, in John chapter 5, Jesus is speaking about the last day when the dead will rise. And this is what he says. In John 5, 25, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, talking of himself, and those who hear will live. Well, he says the hour is coming. One day it will come. When Jesus comes back, he will utter the command and every single person who's ever lived will rise again. That's true. In that sense, Jesus is the resurrection. Does that make sense? That he is the one, the source, in which everyone will come back to life and be judged accordingly. And and in John chapter 5, and I would encourage you to read John chapter 5, he says, all will be raised back to life, but some will go away to be with God in eternal life, and some will go away to judgment. And yet, what he's referring to when he says the hour is coming But even in one sense, the hour is now here where it's possible to hear the voice of Christ and by hearing his voice, be redeemed, be made new. In John 10, Jesus would say that his sheep hear his voice and he knows them and they follow him. That really the journey with Jesus in your life begins by hearing the voice of Christ, by hearing the gospel. The truth is, We've all got questions like Martha, don't we? We've all got theological questions. We all have doubts that we wrestle with. We've all got grief like Mary, don't we? We all have pain, we all have heartache, we all have difficult emotions we have to sort through. But the difficult truth of John chapter 11 is we're all terminal like Lazarus. Lazarus was raised to life and Lazarus died a second time. And if his hope was only in avoiding that initial illness and that initial death, then he would be pitied more than most because he was raised only to die a second time. Does that make sense? 
And so if, if Lazarus, if any of us only have a hope in that initial miracle that we get to experience in this present lifetime, then we're still living without hope. We need the greater hope of the resurrection of Jesus, that we can hear his voice, we can put our faith in him, and we can truly live. And so, I just want you to think of that picture of Lazarus. He's, he's in the tomb, he's all wrapped, you know, he's like wrapped up, right? It almost looks like a mummy. Does that make sense? I know it's like a crude way to think of it, but it's like they would wrap them, like wrap them up. And hear the voice of Christ today saying to you, Come out of the grave. It says he says it in a loud voice. Come out of the grave. If you're here and you don't have a living hope, you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, would you come out of the grave today? Because they don't, Jesus doesn't just raise Lazarus to life. He's got to like hop out of there. And then it's like obviously this kind of like awkward like, can somebody please unbind him. You see that? It's in the text. It's, he doesn't raise him up and he stays in the grave and people can come look like a zoo, like an exhibit. All right, he's awake. Everyone go take a look. He, this is significant. This is the title of the sermon today. Come out of the grave. Come out of the grave. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you've been raised back to life, you've been redeemed, you've been saved, you've been forgiven from your sins, why are you still living in sin and shame? Would you come out of the grave? You've been raised up to life, but why are you still wearing those shackles, those burial cloths? I imagine, he not only said unbind him, I imagine the very next thing is somebody get this man a clean pair of clothes. You... He wants to clothe you in in his righteousness. He wants to free you and give you power over over sin in your life. He wants to do, he has a purpose for you. And this is crazy. Imagine the kind of second half of life that Lazarus had. He got to experience life after death, and one day he'll experience life after life after death, okay? But he got to experience that, like his perspective, you know, people talk about that when they have a near-death experience, right? And something happens that their entire life will be different from that point on. And, and Lazarus, he gets to experience taking the grave clothes off. And if you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I just want to invite you to come out of the grave. To die to your old life and be raised up by the power of Jesus Christ. It's the fourth or the third gift that Jesus brings to this funeral is he brings life for Lazarus. Well, let's look at what happens at the end. This is kind of the the epilogue after Jesus does this sign. In verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. They believed in him. Do you see that? They put their faith in him. They started following him. But some of them, this is, oh, man, because the, the hesitation for a lot of people is like, well, if I was only there, if I only saw it, if I only encountered Christ, then I'd believe. But I'm a modern individual. People who literally saw Jesus raise someone from the dead, this is what they do. Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. They went to the people seeking to kill Jesus. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. And instead of reading the signs and understanding the signs that they're pointing to, this is the Christ, the Son of the living God, this is what they do. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They get scared and they operate out of fear. This is is what's always been mind boggling to me. That there are people who met Jesus, saw him do miracles and still rejected him. And this is two extreme responses. And this is actually what I, what I believe is true about Jesus is he's an extreme individual, isn't he? No one meets Jesus and is like neutral about Jesus. Like, oh, that's a cool guy. I don't know. You meet Jesus and you fall at his feet and call him Lord and Savior or you hate him. That's what people actually experience if you read the Gospels, extreme responses 
to this individual, and some people believe in him, and like, what a story. They're, they're, they're telling this testimony, like, he raised Lazarus from the dead, can you believe it? And they're just like, you know, it's this beautiful celebration, and, and yet some people still want him dead. They're operating out of fear. They're operating out of jealousy. You know, they, they don't believe in Jesus. And so this is what happens. The high priest says this in verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, he played a pivotal role in the, the eventual crucifixion of Jesus, said to them, and this is like an accidental prophecy. This is quite amazing, actually. You know nothing at all, speaking to his fellow Pharisees and, high pri- and priests, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And he's kind of justifying the fact that they want to kill Jesus, but he doesn't actually understand prophetically he's speaking to the very reason why Jesus had to die. It was a substitution. It was one man, not just any man, but the Son of God dying on the cross for the sins of the world in our place and on our behalf for you and for me, taking our punishment. And it would be better that one man take that for the rest of us so that we could live. Isn't that crazy that the high priest who would end up somewhat sentencing Jesus to the crucifixion unknowingly prophesies why Jesus would die in the first place. And this speaks to really the fourth gift that Jesus brings. He doesn't just bring this sign or this miracle in this isolated case. It speaks to the crowd who was there and the fact that we all need hope, don't we? We all need hope. And that Jesus died for us. And his resurrection wasn't just for him. His resurrection was power over sin, death, and the devil. His resurrection was a victory that he shares with us. His resurrection was the stamp of approval. It was the proof that when he says, those who believe in me will live even though they die, the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes that possible for you and for me. And this is the fourth gift that Jesus brings to this funeral. He brings hope for the world. He brings hope for the world. And so you have a choice today as witnesses through scripture to this miracle, this sign, the resurrection of Lazarus, which John paints as like the final catalytic event before the the last week of Jesus. John actually portrays the resurrection of Lazarus, raising Lazarus as the catalyst that led to the crucifixion of Christ. Who are you gonna be in the crowd? Are you going to believe in him or are you going to hate him and reject him? Because what Christ Jesus offers you today is he offers you a living hope and would we be a people that follows Jesus as king? Because in just a number of days, we're not sure how long, Jesus would march into Jerusalem. And we know that it's one of the final events before this, this last week which led to the crucifixion in John chapter 12, verse 13. Today is Palm Sunday, the day that we remember this event. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Would we be a church that worships Jesus for who he is, that, that surrenders our whole lives to him, that falls down before him, that sings at the top of our lungs and shouts. And I recognize, even if you're here today, in the midst of a difficult time, that you would be encouraged by the church singing praises to the one who has given us a living hope. So would we stand and worship our risen king? praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ
Christ our King. Our praise will rise to you, Lord. Cause by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Cause by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me the resurrected king is resurrecting me soldiers wash. Let's remember. The tomb where soldiers wash in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Put your hope in this. Because our God has robbed the grave. Oh, our God has robbed the grave. God, we are witnesses to Scripture, to the stories told. And just like Pastor Josh was saying, I do believe that you are presenting us with two options. Everyone here to surrender to you, to allow you to have compassion for us, to soak in your love once again and then to run out of that tomb. To stop living in the grave, but to run free. And the other option is to walk away. And so God, today, I choose to run to you. Church, would you pray this with me? God, today I choose to receive your love, to let your love bind my wounds, to let your love bring my heart back to life, to let your love <laughs> propel my legs to start running, running to you. In the name of Jesus, we let go of every single hindrance, every fear, every piece of shame that we feel every habit that is just not good for us. God, the trajectory that we have that we just so badly want to get off of, in the name of Jesus, we proclaim the power of Christ in each of these situations, and we declare healing, we declare resurrection, because you are our God, you are our Lord. 
we die to ourselves and we rise again with you. So like Lazarus, we come out of that grave. And God, may we be a people that welcomes each other out of that grave and helps us along to stay out of that grave. So church, if you prayed that today, if you are crying out to God, know that your God loves you so much that he welcomes you in his arms right now, that his love is flowing over you, that there's nothing that can separate you from his love, and that you can let go of yesterday's mistakes and grab a hold of today's hope in Christ. May you walk in the power of the Spirit, filled with the love of God, and may you share that love and that peace with all those around you. So God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this work that you're doing in my heart and our hearts. May we live redeemed. We're coming out of these graves, God. And we're running to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and have a quick seat. Take a look up at the screen. We share things every day. Things that are meaningful to us. That entertain. Inspire or challenge us. We share moments, good or bad, big or small, because what we share matters. We have the chance to share something incredible, the hope that has transformed our lives. And today, more than ever, people are searching for hope, for connection, for meaning, the life we've experienced in Jesus is available to our friends and neighbors, and it's easier to share than we might think. Over the next few weeks, we are running Alpha, an opportunity to share Jesus with friends, family, and colleagues in person or online. Each week, we'll connect with each other, watch a short video, and have time to discuss our thoughts and questions without needing to have all the answers. All it takes is a simple invitation. Share life, faith, hope, Jesus. Who will you invite? All right, good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. I'm Pastor Jay. Good to, to be with you. We got Alpha starting in just a few weeks, two weeks from today, uh, actually. And Alpha is an incredible course uh, for those who are, maybe you're new to faith, exploring Christianity. This is the perfect place to do that. Uh, I'm not new to faith. I'm not exploring Christianity for the first time, at least. But I've been through Alpha numerous times. And every single time, I get something so rich and deep out of it, not only from the videos, but What's even better is the discussion that happens right after that. And uh, Cheryl Clutter, uh, who is one of our women's ministry leaders here, is leading this course again this year and does such a phenomenal job of running that course. And it's really a time to explore Christianity, some of these big questions of life, and then have this um, very non-judgmental, open, free space uh, to dialogue, to ask those questions, to have conversations. So if that's you, we'd love to have you at that course um, starting April 7th. It's going to be at our 1 p.m. service right up here. Uh, lunch will be provided as well. Um, if you know somebody who you really want to be in that course, bring them. Go to it. Uh, even if you're a Christian and you're not new to faith, it is so enriching, and I encourage you to do that. So who will you invite? Not only to Alpha, uh, but who are you going to invite to Easter? Anybody see one of these cards coming in? Got a bunch of them on the back of your uh, pews there, on your seats there. Uh, but this is just an easy way to extend a little invitation to uh, invite somebody to Easter Sunday. Um, Easter Sunday is one of the Sundays of the year that people are most open to coming to, to checking out uh, what is church, what is this whole thing about, and it is going to be a powerful Sunday. And so um, just extend one of these to maybe a neighbor, a 
coworker, a friend. I'm going to be giving a few of these to my neighbors. And uh, you don't have to make it weird. It doesn't have to be awkward, right? Just be like, hey, our church is, you know, having an Easter service next week. We'll have to invite you. Slip them a card, <laughs> you know, right across the table. Um, so invite somebody to Easter. We have four services, eight 30, 10, 11, 30, and 1. Um, if you are one of our Hill City regulars, one of the regs here, uh, love to have you. Please join us either at the 8, 30, or the 1 uh, to make that space for all of our guests in the middle there at the 10 and 11, 30. And if you don't have kids that you're not bringing with you, 8, 30, again, would be so uh, a blessing for you to please come to that one. <laughs> Um, so at those other three, we are going to have kids ministry at all of those. But uh, invite somebody to Easter in order to kind of spruce this place up, get this place nice and hospitable for all of our guests. We're doing a little bit of spring cleaning. Anybody doing a little spring cleaning at their house right now? Come on, I've seen so many garage, garages open this weekend, people fil filtering through those. Um, this is the time for us to do that. Here at the church, going to be doing the grounds inside and out and uh, hopefully just making this a place where people walk in for the very first time and feel like this is home, you know? That's what we want people to experience as soon as they step foot inside of these doors. So doing a little spring cleaning, that's Thursday night and Saturday morning, two options for you there. We're also going to be doing prayer walks during that time. So preparing the building and then preparing things spiritually as well as we pray for our guests who are going to be coming on Easter. So very busy week, Thursday night cleaning. Friday is Good Friday. And we don't have a service here. What we have is a time to come and to pray. We have prayer stations, seven prayer stations that will be around the building here, and it's an open house style. Um, come at any point on Friday evening. You could come for five minutes. You could come for a few hours and come pray through uh, these seven miracles, seven signs, and uh, it is always a very powerful experience coming to set aside some time to pray through these prayer stations. So that's Friday, Saturday morning, again, spring cleaning, prayer walk, and then Sunday Easter. So a lot of things happening. Uh, I want to just celebrate something that we did last weekend. We had our young adult retreat. Anybody go on that? Where are we at? Where are we at? There we go. Uh, it was an incredible time. Brought a crew up to McCall and uh, had an incredible time worshiping. Um, a good time of community, fellowship, friendship. But we were talking about um, finding your vocation, your calling in this life. And, man, I am so thrilled at just, like, what God was doing there. I told the, student, or the young adults the last night, like, I'm both excited and nervous for what's about to happen after this young adult retreat. Because it was actually more about just the retreats. It was about what God is unleashing in the lives of these young adults and what he wants to use them for uh, in this generation. And uh, there's so many things that were just being unveiled, uh, unleashed that week. So many of these young adults want to spend their lives seeking um, God and seeking uh, evangelism and revival amongst their peers, amongst this generation. And so many uh, just innovative ways that God wants to do that through them. And so I am excited for what God is going to be doing next through these young adults. So in a time where young adults are just leaving the church left and right, God is bringing so many here. And he's not only just bringing them here, but he's doing something incredible in their lives and through them. Can we celebrate that this morning? <laughs> Amen. Well, lastly, uh, if you need a prayer for anything this morning, our incredible prayer team is going to be right up here in front that would love to pray for you. If you got tears, if you got the tears of Mary this morning, they would love to pray over you. Um, if you got something you want to rejoice about, they would love to rejoice with you here this morning. And if you can, came prepared to give, you can do so online or with our ushers at the doors. But with that, church, let's stand together. Let me speak this blessing over you. And then feel free to grab a coffee, get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Let the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace, church.